Uh, I usually like to start with a big picture, but the bigger picture, and this is probably the biggest picture that we can take. I took a, a picture of uh, the whole universe, from Wikipedia. Of course, I, I will not talk about the universe, but about the mind that can comprehend it. And in the 19th century, a uh, French uh, mathematician and philosopher, Pierre Simon de Laplace, pondered uh, the existence of a divine intellect, a so called Laplacian demon. And uh, what, he, what he basically proposed is that if there was such an intelligence, such an intellect, that could know all the forces of the universe and would be vast enough, large enough to analyze all the forces, then it would see the future of the universe. As, as we see things in the real world. But, so that was a, an example of, uh, of perfect rationality, super divine uh, rationality. A little bit earlier, in the 17th century, uh, Blaise Pascal and Pierre Fermat, uh, other French mathematicians and philosophers, uh, they laid the, uh, the foundation for uh, probability calculus. <coughs> so basically what they did uh, they uh, considered decisions as lotteries, uh, and lotteries meant actions with uncertain outcomes. So they, uh, they pondered uh, actions that we can take, and uh, the state of the world uh, that, together with the actions, they, they uh, define the outcome of this lottery. And to illustrate this, uh, Pascal proposed the so-called uh, wager, Pascal's wager, uh, he basically, he was trying to answer the question if God is, uh, if it is a rational to believe in God. He said that the question of existence, the existence of God is too difficult. Uh, he wanted to say well, a little easier question. So, is it rational to believe in God? That was his question. And what he proposed is this matrix of two possible states of the world. God exists or God does not exist. And two possible actions that we can take. We can either believe or not believe in God. So we can see that the outcomes of this, uh, of this matrix, of this game, uh, is either uh, if God exists, it's infinite bliss if we believe, or infinite damnation if we don't believe. And if God does not exist, if we believe, well, we have a little less of, of worldly pleasures. And if we uh, don't believe, well, we have the worldly pleasures, we experience that. But in comparison to the infinite damnation, it's uh, just uh, nothing. And the crucial thing here is how to combine the information. So what, what Pascal proposed was the, the way how to answer this question by combining the pieces of information. And his answer is the, the, first, uh, the, the first example of calculating the expected value of action. And so what he said is that even if the probability of God's existence is very small, then if, if we multiply this by the infinite outcome of the, uh, if, if the God exists, of the infinite payoff, then it is rational to believe in God because the expected value of, of such an action, of such an action of believing in God, is infinite, positively infinite. So that is uh, his answer, but not the answer is, uh, is good, it's important here, but the, this very way of integrating the information. Multiplying probability of, uh, of outcome by, by its value. And uh, what I do is take multi attribute decisions, so that means decisions which involve uh, several criteria or several attributes, uh, and the value of the alternative is determined by the value of the attributes. And so the crucial question is how to, how to integrate attribute values into one overall value of, of an alternative. And there is a rule that is proposed as the, as the normative solution to that problem. It's uh, the so-called weighted additive rule, and it's treated as the normative yardstick of, of multi attribute choice. Then it steps uh, directly from, from Pascal's uh, uh, argument, from Pascal's method of, of uh, integrating information. You, you basically have to multiply attribute value by Attribute weight, or the, yeah, attribute weight. Let me explain. Oh, sorry. So, uh, imagine that we have a uh, choice between two job candidates, and we have several cues or attributes for these candidates, like in their intelligence, uh, initiative with, with the research group or the working group, 
uh, or creativity, and the, these attributes or cues are weighted. The weight can be different thing. Uh, either it can be a subjective importance uh, given by the decision maker, or it can be somehow calculated, uh, uh, calculated uh, success of the queue in predicting choices. Because here, what what we are we want to predict is the productivity of the of the of this candidate. So we want to infer some future state on the basis of several queues. And what weighted additive rule does or would do here is. Oh, can I use the laser? Okay. What weighted additive uh, rule would do, it would multiply uh, the Q values for each Q by the Q weights. And then add or sum all these values for one alternative and then it would come to an overall value for one alternative. And then compare these two alternatives on, the, on, the, on the basis of that uh, it would make a choice. So that's pretty complex uh, computation. Of course, it has other problems than, than complexity. Uh, one being the, the problem of endless search, because inherent in this rule uh, is that you should uh, search, you should process all available information. So here it's nice because we just have four, uh, four uh, attributes, but if there are uh, if there is an infinite number of attributes, then this rule is somehow searching and searching and searching. That's one, one answer, that's the normative answer. Uh, how you should make such de decisions rationally. But uh, how far are humans from this ideal? And do, do we make choices in this way? And there's a whole a research, a research program uh, which started uh, among uh, the, one of the persons who started this research program was Herbert Simon, who was a polymath. Uh, he, he has contributions in, in psychology and computer science. Uh, and most importantly, he got a Nobel Prize in, in economics for his work in, in decision making in, uh, in organization, organizations. And what he basically proposed is the concept of bounded rationality. Uh, the idea that uh, in order to make complex choices, humans must use heuristics or approximate means uh, to handle, handle these choices. Because, uh, why is it so? Because uh, decision making is limited by, by limited knowledge, uh, limited time, and limited computational abilities. So we are unlike the Laplacian demon. We have all these limitations, but we nevertheless have to make choices. Uh, we have to, you know, uh, survive in the real world. Somehow we have to, uh, you know, tackle the complexity. And Simon worked on, on several such heuristics. Uh, but w what is what is nice is that his research program is is continued today by the, by this person. His pro this is Professor Gerd Gigerenzer from uh, Max Planck Institute uh, for Human Development in Berlin. And he and his research group are developing a, a research program on simple heuristics. Uh, that make us smart. That's actually the title of, the, of one of their books. And so they, they are analyzing different uh, choice heuristics, judgment heuristics, and how these, how these heuristics can make smart choices, actually. Uh, how, how these heuristics can outsmart the, this, this complex normative model. <coughs> I had the opportunity to work in this group, and actually the research, the study that I'm going to talk about is, is actually uh, based on, on, on the research done there. And so the basic, the basic idea that they, are, uh, that they are advocating is the idea of the adaptive toolbox, of human mind as an adaptive toolbox, or as a Swiss army knife. These are mostly uh, more or less uh, uh, similar metaphors. It basically says that, uh, the, the, this idea says that human mind is equipped with domain-specific tools uh, which are fitted to the particular environments or to particular problems. And the, what decision, decision makers do is they basically uh, pick up or choose one of these rules to, uh, and apply them to a, in the, into a particular problem. So the idea is that there is a repertoire of strategies and you have to choose one of them for a particular problem. And then the question is what determines the use of these, uh, of these uh, decision rules? Are there, is it only the, um, the characteristics of the situation or is it also the characteristics of the, of the decision maker? And if we talk about uh, probabilistic inference, a multi-criteria choice, it's good to, <coughs> it's good to use this, uh, uh, the framework of the so-called Brunswick lens model, 
Brunswick, Egon Brunswick was an Austrian uh, psychologist uh, working around uh, before the, the Second World War, but also after. And he's the author of this uh, the so-called lens model. He basically was, uh, was doing research on how we perceive other people. So for example, how do we uh, def um, guess or infer the uh, intelligence of another person? Uh, we rarely have the, the, the access to the very, uh, you know, to the very value. This, these are so-called latent values that you can, latent variables that we cannot observe uh, directly. So what we do, we observe uh, uh, some uh, uh, some cues, uh, environmental cues, and on the basis of these cues, we infer the the, the, the variables. So it is nicely it's nice uh, it's nicely put in this such a way that we have this lens through which we see uh, states of the world or other people, other beings. <clears throat> and uh, what also, uh, what, what Brunswick also proposes the term Q validity is basically, it's the probability that a Q, with which the Q predicts the, 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 the value of interest. So more, more or less it's a correlation uh, between the value of the Q and the value of the uh, uh, latent variable. Okay, so this is the framework. This is the, the, how, we, we, how it's useful to think about it. <laughs> okay, so on the basis of this framework, we can distinguish two, <coughs> two groups of strategies for, uh, for this kind of problem, for probabilistic inference. One is the, uh, the, an example of one of the, uh, of, for the first group is the, norm, uh, the weighted additive rule. And this is this, these are the so-called compensatory strategies. They, they require much information. They try to integrate uh, the information. <clears throat> and they are compensatory because they're called compensatory because if, you, uh, if uh, an alternative has low values on one queue, it can be compensated by high, high values on another queue. Yeah? So if you're a job candidate who is, say, low in intelligence, but you're has a high initiative, then if someone applies the weighted additive rule, then perhaps you have a chance to be chosen for a job. Uh, on the other hand, uh, <coughs> the, the so-called non-compensatory strategies, they require little information and they do not integrate information. Uh, they are sometimes, sometimes called one-reason decision-making. And the example of them, uh, and of course they are non-compensatory, meaning that uh, if there, if uh, uh, one queue which you use for the decision, uh, uh, if the, the, there's a low value on this queue, then you cannot really integrate, uh, then you re can really compensate uh, by the values of other queues. And the, one, ex uh, one of the examples is uh, the so-called take the best strategy, which basically assumes that a decision maker has a, rankings, a ranking of queues uh, for a particular problem, uh, so a hierarchy of queues, and uh, decision, the decision maker should start from the best queue and say, if we have a two, two alternative problem with uh, binary queue values like plus or minus values, then the decision maker should consider the first queue and see if it discriminates between the alternatives. So if one alternative has higher value than the other, if yes, then, uh, then we choose the option uh, which has the higher value. If no, then we look for the next queue, so next best queue. And then if this uh, happens to be discriminating between alternatives, then we all can, can choose. And if, if, if this disc doesn't discriminate, then we have to repeat the procedure until we run out, run out of the queues, and then we have to make a choice at random. So this is a very simple algorithm. Of course, if there are, there are no discriminating queues, then of course, it can take uh, some time to make a decision because we need to search the queues. But if there is a queue that discriminates between alternatives early in the process, then we can make the choice fairly simple, uh, fairly quickly. And that's why this, this, uh, this strategy is called a, a fast and frugal strategy. That means uh, it helps to make choices fast and with very little information. So, and this is a, an example of a heuristic, choice heuristic. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm, uh, what I'm interested in that in, uh, is uh, the question uh, how emotions contribute to bounded rationality. Uh, and particularly, <clears throat> there is the phenomenon of attention narrowing associated with very intensive emotions like uh, fear, uh, disgust, or with more general affective states like anxiety or emotional stress. 
Basically, if they are associated with high arousal, high physiological arousal, then we could expect that they will narrow attention. And this research, of course, partly stems from, from my uh, PhD supervisor, Edward, Edward Nenska, because the, the whole idea that non-cognitive factors uh, like uh, emotion and arousal can influence thinking is, is uh, the research topic of Professor uh, Nenska's lab. And I also I did my PhD there, so this is the link between decision making and the, and the uh, so-called elementary cognition. And so I'm interested in this uh, this uh, attention narrowing uh, phenomenon. And basically, <clears throat> what it says, what this uh, the what this phenomenon implies, is that uh, well, this is what the normative uh, rule says. If you make choices, then you should take all the cues into consideration. And the attention narrowing uh, perspective or hy hypothesis says that under uh, very high physiological arousal, uh, which, for example, is, a uh, is uh, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, fear and anxiety are associated with such arousal, uh, attention is narrowed. And this would, should lead to selective information processing. That means it should lead to the use of simple decision strategies. Uh, so this is a nice idea, I, I like it, but also there is another uh, alternative uh, hypothesis that you can put forward, is the so-called uncertainty reduction hypothesis. It basically says that uh, such states as fear and anxiety are associated with subjective feeling of uh, uncertainty, and people try to reduce this uncertainty by searching more information. So this is an alternative, uh, alternative hypothesis, which can be uh, <clears throat> which can be contrasted with the attention narrowing uh, hypothesis. <clears throat> so what I basically do is I study decision making, multi-attribute decision making, with the use of the so-called mouse lab methodology uh, or information board methodology. You can see uh, the, the design of the uh, the layout of the of the empirical study. What participants see uh, during such study is a, on a computer screen as a table. Uh, where they have uh, uh, decision alternatives, A, B, C, D, and depending on the cover story. The, in, in this experiment, the cover story was about four job candidates, and they have to uh, judge which candidate is, will be most productive worker on the basis of several cues, uh, can, like personality characteristics, intelligence, and so on. And most importantly, so what they do is basically they click on the on the little boxes in the table and they see the values for these cues, yeah, and they can search this table uh, uh, sequentially. That means they can acquire the values of the cues sequentially. That means if they see, so for example, they can they could see all the cues for one one candidate, uh, starting from the best cue to the worst, but they cannot go back. So for example, if they forget the information about the say the worst cue or the best cue. Uh, they cannot really scroll back to the to the queue to the to this best queue. Yeah. So this is a kind of a, 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 a difficulty in the task. They have to load the queues to memory, and then based on these loaded queues, they have to make a choice. They could also make it simpler. They could sim uh, they could search the the uh, so they could compare the alternatives based on one queue only. Yeah. So they don't need to search kind of in depth. They can search uh, so to say horizontally. So, but basically the layout is that people click on the boxes and they see numbers and they have to integrate these number, numbers somehow. And what I do is I manipulate uh, emotions by showing people either uh, neutral pictures like this spoon or, the, or uh, very aversive pictures like this, this, this mutilated body. This is, this is taken from the so-called international affective picture system. Uh, it's a collection of about 700 pictures and they are they differ in arousal value and also valence. There are positive and negative pictures and highly arousing uh, or pretty neutral. So I basically chose the ones that are, <clears throat> that are neutral like this one, like towels, spoons, and so on. And for the emotional condition, I chose the, the, the very aversive, very highly arousing pictures, <clears throat> knowing that they should, they, should <clears throat> they should invoke a very uh, high attention narrowing. That was the hypothesis, of course. And, uh, so one group of people saw, saw these neutral pictures, one, of the, one group saw 
these uh, aversive pictures, and there were 56 choices, 50, uh, 56 such tables, and each table was preceded with one picture for six seconds. So how the uh, single trial of that study looked uh, is that people saw a slide for six seconds, then they had a, saw uh, the rating scale for arousal. This basically was a slider that they could move on a scale from uh, zero to 100. Uh, and then they saw a valence, and then they could search the information, so they could click on the, on the table, and then they had to make a choice, so which, which, candidates, uh, which candidate they choose. And uh, before that, before each, uh, the, the whole study started, I measured trade anxiety and state anxiety with a questionnaire. Uh, and then there was a training, and there was a test, and state anxiety measurement at the end, so I could compare uh, if state, uh, the, 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 the level of state anxiety before and after. And during the, during the, the, the whole task, I measured uh, skin conductance. Uh, basically, this is the, uh, well, how easily your skin conducts electric current, and this that depends on how, how wet your hands are. And if uh, this is a nice index for, emo uh, for physiological arousal because the uh, 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 skin is innervated by the sympathetic part of the nervous system, that means uh, it responds, of the uh, uh, autonomic nervous system, it responds to uh, stressors, uh, but it doesn't respond to relaxation. So if we have higher activity on skin, con uh, skin conductance activity, we can infer that a uh, subject was more aroused, more, more uh, yeah, more physiologically aroused. So I measured this through the whole, uh, through the whole task. Okay, the, the participants were students of Basel University, excluding psychology and economics students to avoid any you know, contamination of, uh, of knowledge. And, uh, well, you can see the characteristics uh, of the sample. Uh, for the analysis with skin conductance, we had to drop several participants who were so-called non-responders. This, this often happens. Uh, well, if you don't record signal from a participant, that could mean that either the electrodes were wrongly pla pr placed, but also some people just don't show this response at all uh, yeah, because of the properties of the skin, but also the, because of the properties of the, of the nervous system. So these people are excluded. Uh, and are there any questions here so far? Okay. Yeah. Well, they can further click. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry for, but but this is kind of going to be important. Yeah. So, so on every trial, they go through the whole search. Yeah, I mean they could, they could in principle, they could make a decision at once without any search. Yeah? But what they can do is to either they click on the box, the, the box is uh -huh. on the, on the, in the low row, in the bottom row, and uh, information appears on the top row. Uh -huh. Uh -huh? And they could either keep on clicking on one candidate, that means uh -huh. they would see su uh, subsequent cues, uh -huh. information for the subsequent cues, or they could either, either click on the candidate A, so the leftmost box, and the next box, and so on. So and then, then there is another like a button where they say, now I'm ready to make a decision or something like that. And so they choose by clicking on the boxes in the top row. And this is pretty, uh, it's a little awkward, yeah? Uh -huh. But, so there's no, 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 no other button. They just click on, by clicking, uh, they choose by clicking on And the do they boxes. learn uh, whether they make a correct choice in a sense, do they? Well, in this study, we didn't look at the accuracy of the choices. We didn't, uh, we didn't uh, I mean, now, this is a whole story. Uh -huh. uh, okay, well, sorry, this is, okay, this is going past clarification, okay. Yeah, we didn't uh -huh. give them feedback about the choices. In, uh, we only gave them feedback at the end in terms of payment, yeah? But if you are interested in the details, I can, I can explain, but there's a whole debate how to define accuracy in such a... Such right, a but, but, the, the, but this, is, this is relevant because it has to do with whether they have a chance to learn the Q validities, right? Because if you don't no, get feedback... No, in this study, not. I mean, there are studies that, that you look at uh, the effects of feedback and how people learn the Q validities, but also how they learn the strategies. And this study, we just simply gave them choices and looked at what they chose and didn't, did not give them any feedback. And we also did not analyze accuracy uh, whatsoever. 
I mean, this is not, not that we didn't want, but it's a, there is a technical problem. Uh, if you want to infer the strate strategies that are use, uh, used by subjects, then you have to, then it's difficult to talk about uh, accuracy in this, in the sense that uh, they make a correct choice. That means there is some correctness criterion which they fulfill. Yeah? But we can talk about it later. I will explain. Okay. Mm. So first question is if this kind of manipulation works, if people are aroused. And we can look at state anxiety, the difference between pre -test and post -test, and we can see that in the emotional condition, in the emotional condition, the, it's, the, the increase in anxiety is higher. Uh, also, okay, well, cool. In the emotional condition, the increase in anxiety is higher. Also, arousal rating is higher. And valence is lower, meaning that uh, the, the, they feel more negative. And these are pretty strong effects. I mean, they are significant. And this statistic, the, the Cohen's D statistic, uh, indicates that these are strong effects. So we have we made sure, at least with the subjective measures, that they are uh, aroused. We also looked at the skin conductance. And you can see the difference between emotional and and uh, neutral condition. Oh, I should explain what index we use, because there are different indices that you can use from the skin conductance recording. We use the so-called uh, frequency of non-specific skin conductance fluctuations or skin conductance responses. This is basically, the, it's defined as number of, of such non-specific responses per minute. So if, they, there's, if there's no reaction to a, a stimulus, uh, there is a, such a response, then this is classified as so-called spontaneous uh, response. And so, and, and this is a good index of how people are aroused. And you can see that they are more aroused in the emotional condition uh, than in the neutral condition, but this is visible only in moderate levels of trade anxiety and in high levels of trade anxiety, meaning that people who are, who are low in trade anxiety, they, there is, this difference is not existent, so they don't react uh, uh, with physiological arousal to emotional pictures. Okay, so then the question is, uh, well, this is, uh, you can ignore most of the table, you, can, you should look here. We, what we ask is if the subjective ratings of arousal and balance were associated, the ratings uh, on a trial by trial basis, are they associated with, uh, with this physiological measures, uh, measure? And yes, we found that they are quite robustly associated, so both arousal and balance are uh, associated with physiological arousal. So there is this link between subjective rating and, and physiological uh, measurement. Uh, OK, and the main question is, of course, how people process information before making the decision. Uh, and what we looked at is the uh, three variables. Basically, we are interested in if people are more selective in information search uh, before uh, making a decision under under the influence of emotional arousal. So we looked at the n total number of, uh, of acquisitions, so how many boxes they clicked on. Uh, we also looked at time spent on each queue, the proportion of time spent on each queue. Yeah, there were six queues, so they could either spend 100% of time on the one queue or they can spread, uh, spread uh, the attention uh, evenly across the queues. Yeah? And of course, we were particularly interested in if they search, uh, how, how long they spent on the best queue, because this best queue was, was predicted, is predicted by, uh, by the, this, uh, like the best strategy. And if we want to look at how they allocate attention to the queues, uh, we can calculate ent information entropy according to this formula. Basically, if, they, if we have the pro proportions of time spent on each queue, then either these proportions can be equal, and then if we subject them to this formula, we get uh, the value of 1.79 nuts. That's the, that's the uh, unit for, for this kind of uh, for entropy calculated in this way. If people spend 100% of time on the best queue, then entropy here would be zero. So we are, we should, the values of entropy should move between the two, two values, zero and 1.79. So I wanted to make it clear. If people search, spend most of the time on one queue, then the entropy is low. Yeah? If they search equally, they've spent equal amount of time on, 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 on queues, then the, the entropy would be high. 
uh, close to 1.79. So <clears throat> what we did, we, we looked at these three variables and we, well, we used kind of a sophisticated statistical technique which is basically an extension of uh, regression analysis, the so-called general linear, general, generalized linear mixed models. Uh, 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 implemented with uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo. And it's, uh, I won't go to the details, so it's basically like a complex regression model. Uh, we, and we were interested if we can predict, uh, if we can predict these variables with, uh, uh, with the trial variable. That means we wanted to know if these variables change from trial to trial, but we also wanted to know if the condition, the experimental condition, affects the values of these dependent variables. And so what we can see here on this first slide, this is the acquisition, the number of open boxes. We see that it's, they slightly decreased uh, uh, across the task, which is evidenced by the effect of, of trial. But this is kind of a background effect. We are not interested in that. Of course, this might be, I mean, some people might ask why this happened. Uh, but we are not, it's probably due to perceptual learning or fatigue or some other factor. What we are interested in is the effect, in, is the effect of condition. There was no uh, main effect of condition, but there was the effect of interaction uh, of, of trial and condition, meaning that in the emotional condition, people search less information, they open le fewer boxes uh, at the beginning, and this only slightly decreased. Uh, whereas in the neutral condition, they started with more. They opened about 16 boxes at the beginning, and they this, uh, gradually decreased. Yeah, so the decrease was higher in the uh, neutral condition. Uh, more uh, kind of a distinct pattern uh, is seen with the entropy measure. Uh, this graph shows that during the whole task, in the emotional condition, was, uh, the entropy was, was low. I mean, relatively low. It, uh, it was 1.2. And in the neutral condition, it was higher and then gradually decreased. Yeah? So there is this interaction effect, but, uh, but if we look at the uh, uh, overall effect of condition, then on average, entropy was also smaller, uh, lower in the emotional condition. That means that people in the emotional condition search information in a more selective manner. And last but not least, the time spent on the best queue. And again, we have this interaction effect. Uh, showing that in the emotional condition, this time was higher, and it slightly decreased and, uh, uh, through the task. And uh, in the neutral condition, it was lower, and it slightly increased. So we have the interaction effect. But also, if we look overall at the main effect of condition, we have this effect. So in, emotional condi in the emotional condition, people spend more time uh, on the best queue than in the neutral condition. OK, this is a table. These are three tables, which basically they show that there is a link between the, so because one, one thing would be, how much time do I have? Do, do you, five minutes, okay, so I skipped that. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, analysis was uh, uh, the so-called uh, strategy classification. So we, we basically wanted to go beyond the information search. We didn't, because there were studies that show similar results, that people under stress search less information. But we also wanted to know for sure, or m more precisely, uh, what are the strategies that people use before making a uh, choice under emotions? So we, what, in order to do that, we had to generate the predictions of strategies on the stimuli set that uh, was used by participants. So we had the stimuli set that part participants pro processed, and we ran algorithm, algorithms on the, uh, on the on this stimuli. So we had the predictions. For example, we could predict that on trial, uh, one strategy, take the best, would choose alternative A, and uh, stra weighted additive rule would choose uh, uh, strat uh, alternative B. Yeah? And then we could compare participants' choices to the predictions of the strategy. Yeah? And so we, we would have, for example, uh, a number like, numbers like, say, for one participant, 70% 70, 70 of the choices were predicted by the weighted additive rule, and 30 by take the best strategy. And then we would classify this participant, label him as the user of weighted additive strategy. So if majority of the choices was, uh, uh, of the participant was explained by one strategy, then we would put a label on this participant as the user of that strategy. And then we, look, and we, we looked at these two strategies, the simple one and the complex one. And then we wanted to, of course, to know if our uh, uh, manipulation worked for this measure. 
And, uh, well, if we just looked at the comparison between neutral and emotional condition, then there's not much difference. There's only like about 6% difference. The, the, the red part is uh, how many, uh, the, the red part is the proportion of take the best user, users, and the, the, the gray part is the proportion of the weighted additive users. And so you can see that in the emotional condition is two, uh, three fourths of, of participants are classified as take the best users, only one fourth as, as uh, 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 users of the weighted additive. And there's not much difference between the, condition, uh, the conditions. But we also uh, we, we had to acknowledge the fact that people differ in how they react to the emotional manipulation. So we took into account our, our uh, manipulation checks. Uh, so what we did, we, uh, we pulled people, t people together from these two conditions and we basically looked at the increase of state anxiety. Uh, and we divided people into four groups, four quart quartile groups. And so if, if people who, for whom the increase in state anxiety was high, if they were using a, a particular strategy. So you can see that in the, these are uh, data from the four quartile groups. So you can see that in this fourth quartile, that means in people with the highest increase in state anxiety, and these are mostly people from the emotional conditions, condition, but there, there were also, uh, so there were 11 people from the, from the emotional condition, but also three people from neutral condition for whom state anxiety increased during the, the task for some reason. They, for example, uh, I mean, people are, some people are afraid of being tested in such tasks, yeah? So you can see that for these people, for these people, all of them, all 14 participants, used this, uh, this simple strategy. And none of them was, was classified as the user of, of, the, of the weighted additive strategy. So this is, a, this is evidence that the, at least state anxiety is associated with the use of a high state anxiety is associated with the use of a simple decision strategy. We did the same analysis with the, uh, the, the, the physiological, the objective measure of um, arousal. That means the, the skin conductance. And we also divided the whole sample into quartile groups of, uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, of skin conductance fluctuations. We, we looked at the proportions of uh, strategy users in these quartiles. And we can see that in the, the uh, lowest quartile, uh, for, uh, quartile, we have about equally, equal division between uh, <clears throat> weighted additive and take the best, with a slight advantage of uh, weighted additive. And then, if we go to the next quartile, then this, uh, the, the pro proportion of the simple strategy increases quite dramatically. Uh, yeah, so uh, for the discussion, we, we showed uh, with different methods that uh, highly arousing negative effect is associated with uh, the use of a simple strategy, uh, simple choice strategy, and also with uh, accordingly with a, a selective information search. And so we, so we managed to extend previous findings to the analysis of strategies. And this is also a study, the first study that looked at the, the link between physiological measure of arousal and, and choices uh, defined by strategies. Yeah, I would like to thank, oh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll skip that. Uh, or maybe I'm not, how much, I have a minute or so. Uh, so I'm, yeah, so I'm trying to extend this work. I'm, what, what I'm now doing is, <clears throat> On one side, I do more empirical work, of course, so more, more measurements. So now I, I started to measure uh, EEG. And uh, of course, I always, I always look at the moderating variables like working memory capacity. And then uh, I study, of course, the choices uh, or strategy use. So ba basically, what I'm trying to do is to look at very early uh, EEG predictors of, of heuristic or normative choice. And I'm also trying, uh, working on uh, theoretical models a theoretical model that tries to link, link these, these phenomena. And I would like to thank my, <coughs> my collaborators, uh, Dr. Rui Mata, who is now in Berlin at uh, the ABC group, and my supervisor, postdoc supervisor, Professor Rieskamp, and um, people from uh, Krakow, uh, Jagiellonian University from Psychophysiology Unit, and people from Basel who helped me to run the study. Thank you very much for attention. Any questions? We have 10 minutes for questions. Hi, so you, as you can imagine, I really like the study because this is, you know, uh, 
and really sophisticated and novel. But I was wondering um, whether you can... So the reason why I partly ask you about the accuracy questions, because I thought that this is where, where it was going, because right now you can't actually say whether people under the emotional state made better decisions or worse this decisions. Time, no. Right, you just, all you can say is that they basically used that one cue, they did rely, you know, if the guy was highest on just one cue, they went for the guy, right, you know. And, and these other people were combining the values of these other, other cues, yeah. right. But so, but so from the giga renters perspective, there should be situations, uh, there should be many situations where take the best actually gives you better decisions rather than the weighted averaging. So, I mean, a, a really sexy study, for sexy in the sense kind of like, you know, high, paradoxical would be the one that if you show that people in, who are anxious make better decisions and they make better decisions because they are d dumber. Yeah. So are you guys trying to do something yeah, like that? We if, are running a study like oh, that. Oh, okay. I thought I was going to be a co-author. Yeah, I mean, this is the next obvious prediction, uh, prediction that you, you should expect that under some circumstances, for example, in an en environment with a decision task when there is one dominant cue that can be used for decisions, if you use a simple strategy, then you should make a correct choice. This is what, what the research of Giger and Sir group shows. Yeah? Right. So we should expect that under high emotional arousal we should make better choices in a situation when there's one queue, uh, one dominant queue. And to, yeah, so in a different in, in But can, uh, I, can I ask a, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. I'm asking. Because you know, so one in idea is because some people have so you know, this as attentional narrowing, so it's almost like a capacity explanation. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, there is a pot possible functional explanation that in conditions of anxiety I mean you care about what matters, right? Because, you know, like, for example, if you're in a dangerous situation, you know, you're not going to be looking for, <laughs> I'm going to evaluate the color of your eyes and your shirt. and the, I'm going to actually strategically focus on only one cue. And this may be not a capacity effect, but it may be some sort of a strategy effect that people mm -hmm. realize that maybe, maybe, uh, so, so the question is, do you believe this is actually some sort of a strategic choice to rely on one cue, or is it actually because of limited you know, cognitive load or something like that where they cannot think about more than one thing? Or? Yeah, of course, these are two different theoretical explanations. One is the, that it's uh, kind of your conscious choice to, to use that particular cue. I mean, it could, could be both. I mean, I bet that it's a capacity uh, limitation. So what I try to look at with the EEG study is the, a uh, specific uh, index of EEG that tells us about uh, the capacity of working memory and correlate that with, uh, with choices, yeah? I mean, it's a, it's a matter of emotion or it's a matter of, of balance in this case. And also, did you check the complexity I mean, from your example? They seem very different in terms of visual complexity. One seems more easy to process, the other one much more difficult. Yeah, so I answered the second question. Of course, this is a, uh, there is a, in, 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 uh, in vision research on, and the guys who use this kind of, the IAPS pictures always have this problem that some, they don't only differ in the, in uh, uh, emotional content, but also in the visual characteristics. So, of course not. We, t we took them, I mean, we used the IAPS picture for a reason. They are very well researched, and uh, uh, of course they might differ in, in, uh, in visual complexity. Uh, uh, I mean, we, no, so we didn't control for that. We just took the IAPS pictures with the, because they are all rated in, in, pri uh, in previous studies, so we knew that, uh, yeah. We didn't play around. I mean, I, I also am involved in other projects where we look at the differences between, uh, so we try to control for the visual complexity. Uh, but in this study, we did not. It's kind of good manipulation. As for the positive emotions, uh, I, in other studies, I looked at, at positive emotions as well. But with positive emotions, it's kind of a methodological problem because we, if we wanted to use the really highly arousing ones, uh, for the positive, there are different. There are differences between sexes. I mean, the, for men, it's the, the ero erotic pictures, and uh, and also the positive arousing pictures are not so arousing as the negative ones arousing. So there is this asymmetry between positive and negative emotions, right? So the negative arousing pictures are much more arousing than the positive arousing. Pictures. 
negative. Yes, but yeah, but the, the, the primary theoretical reason why we chose these pictures because we were interested in this attention narrowing phenomenon, which we, we assume that we can only see this if we use a very strong manipulation. Yeah, and also the, the you know the uncertainty uh, reduction hypothesis and uh, attention narrowing hypothesis are they are formulated within the negative uh, side of the uh, yeah, for negative emotions. So that's why we also did not uh, well, we did not uh, use positive. Yeah, I mean, so the, actually this research stems from, from the research on time pressure. My postdoc supervisor did studies on uh, how time pressure influences such decisions. And I, so what I wanted to know, I, I had this doubt that with the time pressure, we, if you just have a shorter time, then you can use the, what, what Piotr mentioned, this kind of strategic decision. Okay, so I don't, I don't uh, process all the information. I choose the most important. So you don't know if this, the reaction to time pressure is an emotional one, is it, is it a stress reaction, right? But with this study, we, we try to establish the link between the emotional state and how you process information. Uh, you found that uh, when the skin conductance uh, criterion was used, the first quartile differed significantly from the th three others, whereas in the uh, state of anxiety, only the, the fourth one differed from the uh, three. Uh, these pictures are not contradictory, of course, but they seem to say something different. Maybe the first measure is more objective, whereas the self-report questionnaire is more subjective. What's your opinion about this discrepancy? Yeah, well, uh, as for the, as for the uh, as, uh, objective measure, the physiological measure, the first quartile, the, the value, the mean value for this quartile, quartile is about uh, 2 point something, close to 3, and this is the value observed in a relaxed state. Yeah, if you, do, uh, me if you do this measurement and people are doing nothing, then uh, they have about three such, such fluctuations per minute. Yeah? So we can say that this, this group is kind of people who are, look like they are relaxed, yeah? no matter if they were from the emotional or the neutral condition. Yeah? Anything higher than, than the relaxed state produces this increase in take the best, uh, uh, take the best strategy. Yeah? Of course, mm, well, we can always, I mean, there is this phenomenon of, of, of fractionation uh, that different physiological measures don't correlate and also they, they very often do not correlate with the uh, subjective measures. Yeah? This is the case here, actually. The, the, uh, we of, of course, we looked at the correlation between anxiety and, and uh, this physiological measure and it doesn't correlate. Yeah? This is the tricky bit that, of course, I try to hide. But, but this is not the first study. I mean, there are many studies that don't re that, that report that there is no no correlation between anxiety and and uh, physiological measure. So you, they could be uh, treated as independent uh, independent uh, uh, results, so to say, yeah, from two distinct measures. So I see. Thank you.